let's get going. So welcome to our April interim for mask. We've got some fun things to do. And as we get into those fun things, this is the note well. You should all be familiar with this. Please read it again in case you haven't read it in a while. Uh, but these are the terms under which we participate here. Make sure that we are uh, reading this, paying attention to it, and especially being respectful and kind to everyone else. Some useful links, the notes are here. Uh, thank you, Mike, for being our note taker. Um, our agenda for today, we've talked about scribe selection, the note well, we can bash the agenda. We're gonna start off by putting the first half entirely on Connect UDP and H3 datagrams. We've got a couple of uh, choices that we need to make on that, and it would be good to get some of that wrapped up. Uh, then we're gonna do a presentation that we have deferred quite a few times that's still in the Connect UDP space. Um, and as we finish with our Connect UDP stuff, we're gonna go into IP proxying requirements and try to wrap those up as well. And then if time permits at the end, we've got a little bit of a preview of some of possible solutions for Connect IP uh, in terms of concrete proposals, which I expect we will be talking about a lot more at the next IETF meeting anyway. The other thing we're gonna do is try to time box this fairly strictly. Uh, so we've put times for each of these things. We're gonna put a timer up on the screen and uh, let's make sure that we stick within those uh, so that we have time to get through all the things we wanna do. There's lots of good discussion. Uh, sometimes we may need to take the, some of that back to the list. And with that, let's get started with H3 datagrams. It's going to be all right. Thanks, Eric. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm David Skenazi, and uh, so. On the agenda, we're talking about both Connect UDP and its dependency H3 datagrams, but um, we, there was a lot of conversation recently on H3 datagrams, and we kind of realized that there are some pretty big open design issues, and those would like have cascading effects on Connect UDP. And so what we're gonna do today is we're gonna not really discuss Connect UDP at all because a lot of the open issues on Connect UDP are kind of dependent on these design decision H3D grams. So we're gonna kind of put Connect UDP on hold until we reach consensus on those points in H3D gram, like a, not on like all of the minute details, but at least on the fundamental design goals and properties. And that way, then we can go, go back to Connect UDP after because otherwise uh, we would be kind of changing it a lot. Cool. Next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> so a uh, quick uh, summary uh, for those that haven't been following the list too closely. Uh, so the quick data grab, the data grab frame is an extension to the quick transport protocol, uh, but it is not defined. Uh, it doesn't have defined semantics in HTTP 3, which is an application layer protocol. And because HTTP 3 is multiplexed, you can have multiple requests. So let's say connect UDP, connect IP over the same quick connection. And so when you receive a datagram that applies to one of those, you need to be able to tell which request this maps to. Oh, is this for this connect UDP? Is it for that connect UDP? Or maybe this connect IP? Because you could have all three running at the same time on one connection. So the solution is pretty darn simple. Uh, you put a variant at the start of the payload of the quick datagram frame. And then after that, we have something that we call the H3 datagram payload, which that will then be used by, let's say, Connect UDP or other things. But we start with an identifier that allows this demultiplexing. So that has been the design kind of pretty much from the start. And there hasn't been any question about how to do that. But uh, are we done? No, unfortunately. Uh, the fact that we have a number there isn't enough. We need to associate that variant with the request. So how do we do that? That is the question that we're trying to answer today in the next 57 minutes. Let's dive right in. Next slide, please. So some, some requirements of like the, the specific design that we're gonna build. 
So one, we've been calling fall, it false start uh, to as a nod to TLS. But conceptually, let's say you're doing Connect UDP and you tell the client sends a Connect UDP request, um, it's going to eventually receive a 200 that everything's fine or you know HTTP status code error. Um, but you know this is 2021. Latency is we finally realized that latency is important. We shouldn't burn a round trip to then start our first UDP packet. So an important property is to send that UDP packet alongside the um, the HTTP request. And if the intermediary decides to reject the request, it just drops that datagram on the floor. No harm, no foul. But it means that we don't burn a round trip. Um, another important requirement is intermediaries. So by this, I specifically mean HTTP intermediaries. So just a quick note on terminology. Client is the client. I guess that's not a very helpful term, but it's pretty clear what that one is. Um, the proxy in Connect UDP is the one that responds to the Connect UDP request and opens up the UDP socket. So the proxy is the server in HTTP terms. The target is whoever you're trying to connect to. So let's say if I go to proxy.example.org and I ask it to connect UDP me to google.com, the google.com is the target. Um, proxy example org is the proxy. And then between the client and the proxy, there can be HTTP intermediaries. So that's what I mean by intermediaries. And we need to support those. They make the design a little bit more complicated because there are things that are per hop properties and things that are end to end. But when I say, per, let's say when there's an intermediary, per hop means between the client and then intermediary, whereas end to end is from the client all the way to the proxy. Uh, again, these aren't too exciting, but we definitely need to support them because there are many HTTP deployments that use them. And then the third requirement here is extensibility. Um, we're going to build Connect UDP. We're going to build Connect IP. We already have a lot of interest from working group members about extensions to these protocols. So we need to make them extensible. Uh, and in, a, in an ideal world, it would be really nice if you could extend Connect UDP by only modifying the client and the proxy. Like if you could build extensions without having to modify the intermediary each time, that would be like really lower the barrier to entry for extensions and I think is a very important feature. All right, next slide, please. Now I'm gonna go through uh, a few examples to um, help il illustrate what we mean here. Um, Eric, could you move the timer a little bit like smaller, a bit to the right? Uh, so this is the simplest example where connect UDP without any extensions. So you put your UDP payload in the H3 datagram payload, done. Very simple. You just need a way to associate your, uh, to use the varint to associate this datagram with your request because that request has all the context you need, which is the target IP and port that you need, like which socket that you're gonna actually shove this UDP payload on. Next slide, please. Now let's do the same thing, but let's assume someone wrote a Connect UDP timestamp extension, which is that it allows you to convey at what timestamp the packet was received. Um, and so uh, in that case, you would have a, a format that, um, that uh, has a 64-bit timestamp, for the sake of argument, followed by the UDP payload. Uh, again, that's simple, but the added slight complexity here is when you receive a datagram, you have to know how you're going to parse it. Is this just a UDP payload or is this a timestamp for, followed by the UDP payload? And that's gonna impact our design decisions later because if you have multiple of these formats, it can kind of make things a bit more complex. And especially keep this in mind in, in the context of false start where when you send that first packet, you haven't fully negotiated extensions yet. So you have to be able to tell if this is an extension, a frame with the extension, or sorry, a datagram payload with the extension or not. Um, next slide, please. This is an example that it's a bit more complex, but I think we've already had discussion on the list that it would be useful. And so I'm going to kind of dive into it a little bit because that informs kind of the kind of things that we want to be able to build here. So let's say you have Connect IP and it allows you to um, send IP packets. Uh, we'll talk way more about this in the second half of our meeting today, but let's just assume that we go with this design. Um, and so you send 
you set up your tunnel, you're sending IP packets, everyone's happy. And then you realize, oh, I'm sending a lot of packets that all have the same IP header because it's for this uh, IP header and let's say UDP header, because it's for this one five tuple. It would be great to save some bytes on the wire by compressing that. So let's say you build an extension to connect IP where you say, all right, I want to negotiate in the middle of this stream of this tunnel, let's now start compressing IP. So for this specific IP header, I'm now going to send this, uh, just the IP payload to you, uh, or, or even you know maybe just the UDP payload or what have you, some kind of compression scheme. And you want to be able to have that multiplexed with other IP packets, because there could be, let's say your majority of traffic is for this compressed flow, but there could be other flow on the side. So similarly, you need multiple formats to coexist over the same request. And uh, just one quick point on, on design there is we had discussed on the list, you know, using each separate HTTP requests here um, to be able to negotiate these things, but that doesn't work well with intermediaries because a separate request can be routed to a different backend. So given this, for one request, which is, you know, this one association from one client all the way to a proxy, we're going to need to A, have these uh, multiple formats coexist and B, be able to negotiate new formats on the fly halfway through. Next slide, please. So this kind of leads us to slightly updating our requirements list earlier. The first three are the same, but we add these two new requirements that I just mentioned of having multiple formats multiplexed and, um, and to negotiate midstream. I think I see a question in the chat from MapRG. Sorry, this is Mia. Yeah. Um, yeah, I totally understand your point about uh, multiplexing multiple formats and you want to change in the middle and say, now I want to start compression or whatever, but I'm not sure why you need to um, negotiate in the middle of the stream. Like if you if you know that both and or like for the negotiation part, you really want to know if both uh, would support this kind of um, uh, compression or whatever. And if you know they support it and if you know uh, what the mapping is, you can negotiate everything at the beginning, right? You don't have to do it somewhere in the middle. So in the, uh, if you could go back to slide six, please, Eric. Uh, in this example, as you can see at the beginning, you do not necessarily know what five tuple is going to be. You're just an IP tunnel. That like the fact that you notice later that there's a lot of traffic on the five tuple is not something that you knew at the moment you created the tunnel. That's why you need to be able to negotiate it halfway through. Okay, so I was, I was having the assumption that for basically every IP flow uh, that comes in, you basically send in a known connect request. So you would always just have one IP flow there, and then you would actually know, you know, if it's an IP flow or not. So that that's the fifth bullet on this slide, which is that you can't use separate HTTP requests here because they can be sent to different backends. Mm, no, because they, they would be routed the same way as they would before. If you, if you need them to, to be sent on from the same IP address, you can just tell your proxy to do that, right? Uh, that's not how it would work in our deployments. Like if you want it to be sent from an IP that would be owned by a given backend. Tommy? Um, yeah, let's move on. Can I comment on, on this? Um, I, I was just going to comment on this topic too. Um, so, Miri, like, I mean, I, I definitely, like, I was coming from the same mindset too. I think the key tricky thing here is about intermediaries. That it, like, if you're going to one proxy, yes, that proxy can definitely do the right thing between multiple requests. But if it's possible to do this deployment where you are going through like two different intermediaries or something, those intermediaries may not be aware of everything that you want them to be aware of. And they could end up forwarding on the request to two different actual backend servers that do not know about the same request and may not be able to tie these things together. And so like, you know, I'm thinking about, you know, how this applies to the stuff that we were doing for the quick aware stuff in which we are currently doing multiple requests. And that's another case where it would, be a lot simpler to work with intermediaries if you have one request end to end, and then you can do message control messages within that single request to kind of add and remove things. It's less work to stitch things together. So essentially think of it as the stream ID 
being the the request ID that's this end to end thing. And that's all you need to get through intermediaries. And then with the end to end, you can negotiate whatever other IDs or um, other extension properties you want. And those are effectively hidden from intermediaries. Then you don't need to worry about having all the intermediaries know about each of these and who to forward them to correctly. Yeah. Thanks, Tommy. Totally agree. Uh, ben Schwartz. Could you flip to slide seven? So I think that the the word negotiate here is is possibly uh, generating a little confusion. Um, I think that we're talking at least some of the designs we're talking about here. Uh, the payload formats are negotiated once um, at the top of the request and then instantiated it with different parameters mm -hmm. um, midstream. So depending on what you think the word negotiate means, from, from my perspective, I think of negotiation as the thing that happens uh, at the beginning in the request and response. Okay, so may maybe negotiation was not the, the right word, I apologize. What I meant to say was this in this Connect IP example to associate, um, you know the the semantics. Let's say the the, the members of this five tuple with uh, a format kind of in, in the middle. So maybe negotiate is not the right word, but exchanging this information. And I think in further slides I might use the word negotiation as well. So please think of it. That's that's not that's what I mean. Not necessarily with that other definition. So sorry for using unclear terminology here. All right. Uh, next slide, please. Cool. So now that we've kind of landed on, on a, a rough sense of what we're trying to build and some requirements, um, let's go into uh, the design discussion. So I, I've, I've split this up into a bunch of binary questions on ways we can solve a lot of these problems. And uh, I, on a lot of these, I personally have opinions, but I'm not tied to any of them. Like I care a lot about the requirements and what the system can do. But for a lot of these, let's see where we can go. As you may notice, I have posted a picture of a glass bike shed, and please don't go and try to paint the glass bike shed. That is a bad idea. So what I mean by that here is let, let's really focus on the 10,000 foot, very high level architectural design possibilities. For a lot of these, there will be many details and nuances to get right. Um, but we don't need to get into these today. I think if we today, we only have 44 minutes left. If we manage to answer the top level, like architectural points, that would be incredibly helpful. And then we can, you know, on the list or at a next interim or sometime very soon, really get into the meat of how we want to encode these bits. Cause those, that is also very important, but let's first get the architecture right and then get all the details. Perfect. Next slide, please. Um, all right, so this was a, an idea that was proposed by uh, Ben Schwartz recently, and I like it. So one, uh, you know, I, intentionally at the beginning of this presentation, I was very vague about using the word barint, um, like for, there is a number at the start of the quick datagram frame payload. Um, that, uh, that number in the current drafts, is called the flow ID and the flow ID. So if you see on the, it's on the left column here, uh, it is a connection wide concept that is per hop. So again, it applies to one quick connection, not to an end to end request. And it, 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 it solves two per, or it handles two, serves two purposes. One is to map from this datagram to a request. And the other is to additionally map inside that request to what I'm calling in request context. So for example, in this IP compression, it'd be to that five tuple. So you have one flow ID and it gives you all this information. Um, the downside of that design is that it's a bit more complex for intermediaries because since this flow ID is a per hop concept, intermediaries need to do translation on both hops. Um, and so Ben proposed a two-layer design where at the start of the datagram frame payload, you don't put one variant, you put two. And one is the stream ID, 
And that gives you an association with the um, HTTP request. So the stream ID is already a per hop construct in Quick. And so intermediaries know how to handle this. And you would pretty much just reuse that and give you a direct mapping. And then after, and so that gives you a mapping from the datagram to the request. And then you add a second number, potentially encoded as a variant, um, that is, we also call flow ID. We might want to pick a different name, but let's just call it the flow ID for now. And that one is actually end to end. And that is like tied to a request and it maps inside the request to the specific context. Uh, so let's say like this, you know, five tuple compression that we were saying. Um, and so the downside here is that it, it sends one more variant on the wire, which uh, in, in practice will often mean we waste one byte. Not great, but also not the end of the world. But it gives you a much cleaner separation where from an intermediary perspective, you have to rewrite the stream ID, which you already do when you're forwarding requests. But the flow ID, you just leave it as is and you don't care. Um, and when you're doing you know, negotiation, you just send that seemingly back and forth. So I want to hear folks' thoughts on these two designs here. I'm, I'm personally leaning towards the, the two-layer design because I think the, the cost of one byte is, is worth it for something that is cleaner and simpler for intermediaries. But uh, I, I would love to you know, get some, ideally reach some consensus in the room that we would you know, confirm on the list of, about picking one of those two designs. So please step up to the microphone and tell us what you think. Jana? So this is perhaps just me trying to understand this uh, better. So I'll ask questions uh, for that. First, the, the, the flow ID sounds more like a request ID to me. I mean, it is per request after all. So it seems like it is really just a request ID, is it not? So, no, uh, the flow ID is inside. So, it, it, sorry, there is a namespace of flow ID for each request, I guess. So per request was in the other sense of per request. That's yeah, That was not the right word, I guess, sorry. Uh, like a, a given connect UDP request has a set of flow IDs. I see. So conceptually, see. the stream ID is what tells you which connect UDP request. And then inside the connect UDP request, you would have flow ID zero, which means just this uh, UDP payload. So ID one means um, the um, sorry. So ID one means um, timestamps. Uh, timestamps. Thank you. Sorry, I heard some really weird noise. Threw me off, of course. There. And then you know. So then you and then you can negotiate them midstream to have like uh, meanings with additional things. Does that make sense, John? It it does. I mean, what you're saying is that it's really it's really context ID. Uh, it's what it's sounding like more and more to me. Like you have yes, that, within... that is actually a, a good that is a good name. Yes, uh, I like that because flow um, flow is abused all over the place. I don't want flow, um, but it sounds like it's okay. specific to a request and to a context. So okay, that helps me understand it better. And the stream ID here is what flow ID used to be. Uh, yes, could, could, minus well, the so flow, in the first context. Yeah. Minus well, yes, yeah, so flow ID used to be the sum of both, and now we've kind of split it in half. One is the stream ID, which is you know the literally the quick stream ID, and the other is the is it exactly the quick stream ID? So in Ben's proposal, it was the quick stream ID divided by four because all requests are you know mo zero module four, but we don't need to like figure out the encoding today. That's okay. Okay, I'll, I'll let the others go. I'll think about this a bit more. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think next is Tommy. Yeah. Um, so I, I also, like you, think that we kind of need to go with the two layer design. Um, after IETF 1 and 10, we had bounced back and forth a number of ideas. And like independently, this is kind of where I ended up as well. Um, I, I think largely. As you were saying, it, it has to do with the fact that we have intermediaries. Like, if intermediaries did not exist and we did not need to worry about them, then I think the single layer design would be fine. But really, I, I think of the stream ID purely as a convenience 
for intermediaries and management of where to route this particular frame. And then all of the other stuff that, you know, at least I had thought of for flow ID really is this context. And, you know, even last time, you know, we were having these arguments about what does the flow ID mean? Um, and I think some people viewed it as oh, it's just for routing like a stream ID. And some people were saying like, no, it has meaning to what is this request. Splitting it up, I think just makes it a lot clearer. And then it's very clear that sometimes you will have these degenerate cases where you don't need any extra flows. You're just always using the zero flow ID or the context ID because it's a very basic thing and that's okay. Um, so yeah, let's do the two layer design. All right, thanks, Tommy. Uh, Maria? Yeah, I, I also think this that two layer design is, is cleaner and, and therefore nicer. Um, I can also agree that the flow ID is very confusing. Uh, I would even propose to not call it context ID, but just context. Because I think we should still um, discuss what the what the semantics of the context ID is. So you could also have an extension that just defines that like whatever th these two bits uh, of the context should be the ECN bits, right? Um, so it's basically at the moment it's just a field, and then an extension could kind of assign any kind of semantics to the field, and that's what we want. So thanks, Maria. Well, the, the, the reason it's an idea is that specifically it would be encoded as, let's say, a variant, because uh, Quick likes variants, and that would map to a context that could mean more things. So it could mean ECN bits and other things. Uh, and then you could you know, conceptually just choose to encode the ECN bits in there, but it just stays conceptually an identifier um, that, that points at something. Yes, yeah, so for me, the difference is that, you know, um, an extension could rather define a semantics about how to use this context, while um, if you just have an identifier, then basically for every request, you, you would use a different set of identifiers to mean the same thing, um, rather than defining a semantics for a field. But this is something we can argue about later, I think. Yeah. Um, these yeah, are the options. That, that, yeah. that, that makes sense. Thanks. Uh, and then in the uh, in the chat, because I'm going in order, right, Klein mentions that uh, like our CAD724, which is static context header compression, has kind of similarly a concept of identifier that maps to a compression context. So yeah, that, that's that's how I would. Uh, it is similar in idea to what I'm just going to call it context ID from here on out because I really like that name. Uh, but we can pick the, the name later. Kazuho. So I also prefer the two-layer design. The other benefit is that it simplifies the design of the string chunks. So it removes the headache of separate, having separate mechanisms for identifying context when we use string chunks. Cool, thanks. Okay. Uh, Matt in the chat prefers context over flow. Great. Uh, Luke Curley. Oh, hello. Uh, so um, I think my only thing is, uh, well, first off, I really like the, the stream ID mapping. Uh, it especially makes it uh, great when you receive a datagram uh, before the connect request, and you can tell, oh, hey, there's going to be a connect request coming. You can you can buffer it. Um, the only thing is the the context ID seems it's a little uh, application or protocol specific. Like I can totally imagine a case where I don't want to send a zero on every packet. Like it feels like it could be negotiated on the connect request. What the you know what the first bite's going to be so, so th that part we uh have a further slide to discuss so hold that thought and we'll get back to it sounds good um thank you uh then uh alex um i also want to say that i think the two-layer design uh, makes a lot of sense and uh i however want to say that while i agree that flow id is not a great name i think context is in many ways worse because what is a context um so I would prefer that we not use that name. Um, I do, however, feel pretty strongly that it should be an ID and extensions should not be attempting to use it as a bit field and trying to assign different uh, semantics to the identifier. That should be done in the payload that they themselves are using from this ID that they have allocated. All right. Thanks, Alex. Um, then Lucas has another clever name for it, but let's not try to bike shed the name today. Uh, so uh, I, see, I see Martin Duke in the queue. 
Yes. Hi, David. Uh, I have a clarifying question and then uh, either a comment or a question, depending on how it goes. Um, first of all, so to be clear, it, it, the, the flow ID or context, whatever we're going to call it, is that globally unique? Can two streams share the same flow ID or uh, what's, what's the relationship between the two things? So the, the namespace would be specific to a request. So two requests, or in other words, two streams, could reuse the same number for different meanings. The uh, the number would be tied to like the namespace would be per like tied to a request. Okay, well that's good. That will probably shorten the length of that variant then. Uh, that's good. so. The other question is about ECN. I mean, I think you you I know people don't like ECN as an example, but I care deeply about whether or not we get that in. And the 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 flow ID oh. is. Um, I mean, if that's if that's end to end, and and like the ECN signaling needs to be per um, per hop, right? So how does that how do those interact? Or am I am I not understanding the problem correctly? I think you're not understanding EC. Well, sorry, I'm confused. E, the ECN and my understanding, and I have a, a slight draft there. ECN is a property of a packet. It's not a property of a hop or end to end. It is a property of a UDP packet that then get it supplied to a datagram. So then it is a property if you of it would be a flow slash context ID that would be a way to encode that this this UDP payload had ECN. But um, we I don't want to get too much into the discussion of ECN because there are multiple ways to solve this and we don't necessarily agree on that. Well right, but but what I guess what I'm saying is if if it's I mean if if flow IDs are thought of as an end to end property, like the, the packets are destroyed and reconstituted at every at every proxy hop, right? So that ultimately No, no, they are not. Hold on, hold on. Packets are not reconstituted at every so at every intermediary. Like packets are sent. Oh uh, yeah, from yeah, the, yeah, the yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, okay, I got it. Yeah, 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 I got you. I'm sorry. Yes, because actually I have this wrong. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Jan is back. Yeah, thanks, uh, David. So I um, I think that uh, if if I understand this correctly, I think that the two layer design makes a lot of sense. And I don't think of it as two. I guess it is two layers in some sense, but it's not because they're orthogonal, right? So the way I understand this now is that your streams are. Uh, I think Tommy or somebody said this earlier that stream IDs are really for routing. And, and I appreciate that. So intermediaries need to understand that intermediaries might change it even as they go from one hop to another hop. But the context ID is really going end to end. So in that sense, it is, it is, it's, 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 it's two layers, but at the same time, the purpose is completely different. Um, and uh, I don't, I, but I think given that the two layer design seems to make sense to me. I do have one question on, on uh, and you can point this to later. Basically, how are the semantics of the context ID defined? Are they, and you said that they're defined. That, that'll the show up particular in a particular stream. Time. Okay, good enough. Otherwise, I'm, I'm, I think I like this design. I, I, cool. the, the reason I'm asking about the context of uh, how the context ID is defined is because it sort of makes me, I'm trying to understand if context ID is important or useful. But we'll get there. Yes. Uh, cool. Thanks. Uh, then, uh, Tommy says plus one on this being an ID and not a bit field because it avoids conflict better. I, I do agree with that. Uh, and folks talking about the name. Cool. All right. We've drained the queue. The sense I'm getting is that there's in the room overwhelming support for the two layer design. So we can confirm that on the list later. Next slide, please. Now, uh, another design question, the flow slash context ID, is it unidirectional or bidirectional? And so let me explain what I mean by this. In the current drafts, uh, the, the concept is bidirectional in the sense that once one endpoint says, this context ID means this, then you can send in both directions. And another way you could design this, which some of the proposals had, is something unidirectional, which any endpoint, like where you end up having per request two namespaces, one in the client to proxy direction, one in the proxy to client direction that are separate. That might end up being the same, but they're separate. And then you kind of make a declaration unilaterally and you say, 
this ID for me is worth, it means this, and you don't negotiate it. Uh, and whereas in the bidirectional sense, you kind of say, I'd like this ID to mean this, the other side says, okay, this ID means this, and then you can use it. And that also still allows a false start in the same way that um, you know the regular ConnectUDP mode does. And I see questions, so I'm gonna, uh, Lucas. I'll be serious for a change, sorry. Um, so I, I, it's not a question more than a comment, so I do apologize, but the I think seeing the example of like IP compression that you presented in the recent proposals um, shows that the, the bidirectional design just breaks down because, well, for example, the client is saying I'm gonna I'm gonna send you this this thing with some compressed IPs and I want you to uncompress it and send that forward. That doesn't necessarily mean that the packets coming back want to be compressed in the same way, and therefore, if that's not true, then the bidirectional thing just doesn't make much sense to me. Um, and therefore, the unidirectional design is more attractive because you you can create a two way two way logical um, relationship without this kind of pretend bidirectional thing that may or may not be true. So the that is true. the The one downside that I noticed in conversation this morning was uh, the the problem with uni well with unidirectional is that it's it's not negotiated like you, you you don't get a chance to accept or reject uh a declare a declaration from your peer and that could be a dos vector we don't want to add anything in the protocol that lets an endpoint create incremental memory use on the peer because that could be bad and so uh what you're saying is i think there are and you're right there are use cases where the bidirectional will only be used in one direction and you know okay we've way like wasted a little bit you know it's a 62-bit space so it's not a huge deal it means in some edge cases we'll use a slightly larger variant but i don't see that as too big of a problem um and i think that there are some extensions that like the idea of being able to um say no i reject this um uh this my uh sorry the, this negotiation might be useful and that's why i'm kind of personally leaning towards that but Again, both yeah. of those work if we find a way to make them work. Just to respond, I think I think you can achieve what you just said without having to couple it to being bidirectional and just have like separate a tangential that the the registration of a flow or whatever you want to call it um, and the rejection of it is different than a yeah I'm going to set something up in two ways. This is how quick streams work. That you can uh, if the peer wants to to create a unidirectional stream to you you are still able to shut that stream down. Um, that's kind of how things work today. And I don't see much difficulty in translating that into, into a mask design myself. Yeah. Okay, so so what you're, you're saying is that we could make it unidirectional, but with a negotiation step. That that makes sense, uh, is absolutely. Uh, okay, that is a third option here. Um, I'm gonna take quite a, like other questions and comments and see what folks think about that. I, I totally see that as a, as, as a viable third option. Uh, Ecker. Hardy. Um, yeah, because I'm not, so I think like bidirectional is clearly simple and it matches the sort of implied semantics here, which is that the, which is that the client initiates connections and that it's in charge and the proxy takes the client's instructions. Um, just to head off like previous uh, later suggestions, um, you know, yes, we might want to look incoming connections, but those are the opposite. And the server should, and the proxy should be saying, here's a new connection, the client should have opportunity to reject it. And so we should, if we ever want to do like the thing Christian wants to do, where you can run a server, that should be, that should be, that should be simulated as if it were the, um, the peer taking, the, the, the proxy taking what is currently the client role for that particular bit. Um, um, so, so just to add a clarification on that specific point, uh, in the bidirectional design, uh, the way you solve this is by having, you know, like we do in the rest of Quick, the even numbers are client initiated, the odd numbers are server initiated. So this works in either direction. Right. No, I don't, I understand, I understand what you're saying, but, um, uh, well, okay. So I, I guess, I guess I'm not really. Well, I don't quite understand what, what does a server initiated flow mean? What are the semantics of server initiated flow? 
Uh, so l let's say, for example, that uh, the IP compression example, where the, I'm sorry, I missed that. The, I just have for a little bit, so you have to recap it. I'm afraid. Okay. So very quickly, the request is client initiated. The client says, "I want to set up a VPN tunnel to you," uh, and the server, ex you know, accepts that, and they're happily sending IP packets back and forth. And then the server can say, hey, I'm realizing that I'm sending a lot of packets with the same five tuple to this client. Let me tell the client, I would like to compress these now. And that's a server initiated uh, negotiation of a flow ID. So then I guess I, I, then I don't understand what the semantic difference is between these two proposed um, between these two designs. Because in either case, the server can initiate arbitrary number of things and tell you and, and try to force them on you. And so you and so either you either you allow, either allow the server to create an arbitrary amounts of state or you have a rejection mechanism. But I don't understand why with the differences between these two settings. So so the the, the main yeah question is whether we allow a rejection mechanism or not. Uh, the in the draft the way the bidirectional one was set up was that one side sends something and the other side kind of echoes it to signal that it likes it. Um, but we haven't kind of nailed down all the semantics. So conceptually, the, the fact that it's unidirectional, bidirectional ends up being very much the same thing. The only important thing that we need to figure out is whether there's a way to reject it or not, I think. Yeah, I, I guess I'm also like, sure. Well, I mean, if you think it's a, a DOS factor to allow the peer to like have infinite state, then you, know, like, then you have to allow it to reject it. So I mean, like you know, um, yeah. Now, now it's certainly, I mean, it's certainly can have to hang up the phone. But um, the, um, I guess I, I, I'm sort of like I'm getting a little worried about this conflation of flow to, uh, to to, to compression state. Um, um, that seems like a really kind of an odd, um, an odd design choice. Uh, I don't think it worked out that well in turn, for instance. Um, you know. Uh, um, I mean, so like, you know, so so what happens if you have you know partial, uh, partial compression, right? Um, you know, it's um, you know here's a here here's a new um, you know uh, so so I mean here, here's like a dumb example, but like you know here's like a new connection ID, but um, you know I'm going to compress the uh, I'm going to compress the the packet numbers for some reason, right? Um, um, and I've got and I've got some mechanism compress the packet numbers, um, or I mean. Um, I guess I just think like, I guess I'm just like, uh, I think every time we try to like tag some piece of state with an integer, that's like, that's probably like a fail. Um, and, and, and certainly these are, these are not conceptually extreme. So think, say, compression is saying quite different. So I guess I'm not, I, if the motivating example here for like having this sort of like initiation of both directions is compression, then I'm like not persuaded by any of it. <laughs> Uh, I mean, there there are a few other examples, and uh, maybe go and grab the slides there, or you know, watch the video at the end. But sorry, I'm not going to repeat the the whole sure. thing. So. Okay. Well, I guess I'm unable to come down on one design, so I'm not sure I need either of these things. In the way, in the right. way it's framed. Thank you. And next, I have Tommy in the queue. Oh, sorry, sorry. No, Ben. Ben was after Ecker. Uh. So yes. Bidirectional and unidirectional both have essentially the same DOS vector problems. Um, I think that's orthogonal. Uh, I do think that Agreed. this is a this is a great time to talk about context instead of flow. Uh, and I do think that Ecker's analysis is is um, on the facts correct. Like this is a um, this is essentially a compression context. Uh, we are in almost every case talking about removing information from the payload that is repeated or constant across payloads. Um, I, I don't in, think in that's the, true. I don't think in, that's true. That, that is a motivating example. And take the time step extension is the opposite, where this flow ID slash context ID would say, this is how you parse this packet, and there's additional information at the start. So it tells you how to parse this packet. It could be a decompressor. It could be additional information. It could be all sorts of things. Sure. Uh, in principle, though, I think that we can still represent it that way. Essentially, all of these cases that add information, we could say, well, there's some, there's some uh, maximum state that actually conveys all the information explicitly. And then the various context IDs are different ways of representing subsets where some of that information is not relevant. So I think that that it is is still essentially correct 
in all the in all the cases that I've seen so far to describe this as a compression context. I think that's valuable. Um, I think that we're that the overheads we're talking about are high enough that the the mechanisms we're talking about are simple enough that it's worth it. Um, part of the reason I think it's simple enough is that I don't think we need rejection because again, these are all just compression mechanisms. And so the peers can agree at the beginning what compression mechanisms they support. And then as long as they send each other well-formed compression context descriptions, they should be able to compress without needing to reject. Well, what about the DOS vector? If I go and I send you two to the 60, I want to compress this IPv6 address. I want to compress that IPv6 address. Like you should have a way to say, okay, no, 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 stop. That is, you're being unreasonable. Uh, yes, that's the same as HTTP two and, and possibly quick. Uh, no, because those have flow control mechanisms and I would really prefer not to build flow control into this cause that's hard. So HTTP two has a, a, an explicit configuration for maximum number of, of live requests or streams. And if we really think it's necessary, we could build in a similar, uh, limit that's uh that's negotiated here or we could just say be reasonable don't don't go nuts uh and... can, I, can i just ask a clarifying point because i think i'm getting lost in this dos thing like as i understand it if i'm going to offer a new indicator that says from now on flow 32 means it's got like this ip address or, or this other compression point i can't start transmitting on that thing until i've received some acknowledgement of that uh, that was delivered right exactly. um, and then you, has... you can you can and it's it's false start um we discussed that earlier. Conceptually, the idea is you send with this flow ID, and if the, the other side rejects it and sees a flow ID has rejected, it just drops it on the floor or sees a flow ID that is unknown. Oh, yes. If you're willing to take like four RTTs of like a data loss into it, it doesn't work out. Sure. Okay. <laughs> um, that's like, I, I like, I don't, I'm not very persuaded it's going to work, but okay. I understand your point. All right. Um, I think we're going to kind of drain the queue up to the point where it's cut a bit quicker. So Alan, if you could make it a bit quick, I, it sounds like we're not reaching consensus can on I, a specific slide and I want to go can back I, to the, uh, the next ones. I, I was skipped in the queue. Oh, Please. sorry. Sorry, Tommy. I apologize. Yep. Tommy, you're next. Great. Um, so I, I definitely agree that the bi-directional versus unidirectional is separate from whether or not we have acceptance or acknowledgement of the of the request that initiates a flow ID. And I, I think the bidirectional and unidirectional is a total bike shed. Um, I think I agree with Ecker that it's nice to have bidirectional. That seems to be more consistent with a lot of things that we have. I could live with unidirectional though, but yeah, but I'll put a vote in for bidirectional. I very much disagree with Ben um, about the fact that you know all of the extensions are just compression contexts and that we would never need to have any ability to reject or negotiate um even if i think a dos attack is one way to think of it in terms of increasing state um but there are also cases where i may very simply be requesting a given context to say that, hey, I'm doing this to map for this local IP address on my IP tunnel, or I'm trying to do this. And the proxy can just say, you know, you have an error. Like this, all the packets you're gonna send on this are going to be dropped because the address that you're trying to send from that you're binding this to for compression, you're compressing away is not one we assigned or let you use for this tunnel. Or, hey, you just added two different contexts for the exact same, um, ECN marker or something like this, essentially say you sent nonsense. Um, and this is totally different from HTTP because in HTTP requests, we have a status we can send back. Like you can send an error to say, no, go away. And similarly with quick, we can say, stop sending. You can reset a stream. Having no mechanism for the peer to say, hey, you know, all of those packets you're sending to me, I'm dropping them on the floor and I don't want any of them. If we don't build any way to do that, then we are losing something that we have today when we have a kind of a unique request per flow. And I, I think it just makes, if we don't have a way to negotiate it, it essentially only lets you do it for things that you have pre-negotiated. And I think we would have to kind of pre-approve everything in the actual 
header request response. And then you wouldn't have any dynamic nature. You wouldn't be able to make sure that future changes to what you're wanting to forward or tunnel um, are going to be associated to the right end to end context through intermediaries. So I think we should split them up and it's, I, I don't see a way that we can get away without negotiation. Okay. Thanks, Tommy. Uh, Alan. Uh, yeah. So uh, this question is, I think, related to unidirectional versus bidirectional. It, but it, if it's not, feel free to move on, which is what is the lifetime? Uh, how long am I allowed to send datagrams on a particular stream ID, flow ID pair? Particularly, am I allowed to send datagrams on that stream ID after I'm no longer allowed to send stream frames on that stream ID, yeah. like after I've sent the thin yeah. bit? Um, uh, and, and, and how does that impact bidirectional yeah. versus unidirectionality? So th those are separate. Now that we've uh, agreed on the like two layer or two variant design, the stream ID bit that's tied to the stream. So we haven't spelled this out, but my view is the lifetime would be equal to the lifetime of the stream. So once that stream has been finned or reset, you're no longer allowed to send datagrams with that stream ID. Uh, the flow ID is inside of a given stream. And so that would have like, again, the lifetime tied to the stream. Okay, I, I can think of an example where I might want to, well, I can think of an example where I want to receive datagrams, like where I sent datagrams, and then I sent the fin on the stream, but the fin arrived first. And how will the receiver handle those datagrams? And, and again, if this is, if you want to move on and handle this later, but I think it's something that I just want to understand. That's a, that's a good point. I haven't thought of that. Can I ask you to file an issue? Because I think we should get to the bottom of that. Yeah, for sure. Cool. Thanks. Kazuo? Well, regarding directionality, I can I kind of wonder if we can simply support both because we had similar discussions for quick streams and in supporting both. Because the directional only approach turned out to have many pitfalls. And I prefer doing that because we have 62 bit space and you know we can waste some numbers. That is also an option. All right, thank you. Cool. So um, the sense I'm getting on this one is we don't have clear consensus. Definitely, uh, we definitely need it. So we're going to keep discussing this uh, this one on the list. But let's try to answer some other separate questions. Next slide, please. All right. How do we negotiate these? Um, so at the in the current drafts, this is done using the datagram flow ID header, where at the start of your request you say, "I want to use this flow ID." Um, and you can send a list, and in that list, you use the parameters to explain the semantics and the formats. Uh, the, the problem there is it prevents you from creating an, uh, from negotiating this midstream that like we talked about, which is kind of sad because we could build some cool things with that feature. Uh, and also the, uh, the format of this list, uh, people didn't really love that. Um, so another option, that we looked at is to instead use a register message that you send kind of midstream. Um, we'll talk in further slides how that uh, message is encoded. It could be an HTTP frame, it could be something else. That, that's in further slides. But for now, the, the important question is, do we want to enable sending this midstream? I think it's personally very useful and it's not that complex to add. Uh, what are thoughts on, on this? Because um, the sense on the list is that no one was happy with the header. And so far, I've seen people that were happy with the, the, the message. So maybe in the interest of time, if you uh, let, let's keep it short. But yeah, let me know what you think. Alex. Um, I explicitly support the message because I think that there are useful uh, capabilities with doing things midstream. Cool. Thank you. Edgar? And just to confirm, okay, and so this, this, but this is the same issues about timing as previously. Maybe you have to worry about, um, about, about risk conditions between the flow ID, but in this, this, this message and the actual flow, like flow messages, right? Uh, so the, the, they're tied questions. If we have a message, then we need to answer the question of, is there a way to uh, accept, reject this message or not, which was the question on the previous slide, but we haven't gotten to the bottom of that. But that is still something we're going to need to answer. Right. Um, okay, and you wouldn't allow me to rename them, I imagine, right? 
Um, given that we have a 62-bit space, I would expect to not reuse because uh, we had discussion about reusing last uh, last ITF, and folks were saying let's not reuse. Um, okay, well, I think provisionally I prefer register. Okay, thank you. Uh, Kazuo? Well, I'm not sure if I follow the benefits of register flow ID message design, because if I recall correctly, we just agreed to use two layer design so that intermediaries can be ignorant of what the contexts are. But now it seems to me that we are, the, the, the message design is adding for each intermediary to understand this extension. Hmm. Oh, no, so that, that that's a very good question and I should have explained this, I apologize. Uh, so the message, would flow through the intermediary. The intermediary would only see like the stream ID and it would not touch anything inside. It would treat everything inside, including you know the flow IDs or context ID or whatever, or the you know way to encode what the format is. All that would be completely opaque to the intermediary that would just copy bytes on, on one side to the other in the same way that it should be three data frames or the contents are generally opaque to intermediaries some of the time. Thank you for the clarification. So I think some of my concerns have been resolved, though I'm not sure if we need two ways of exchanging end-to-end -end messages, one being the datagram, uh, one being the one being those sent on the data frame, being the string chunk or some other thing. So and the that's other gonna be a, the, the, how we how we encode this is the next slide. Okay. Uh Alan? Yeah, I guess I'm wondering, is it also, given that if this passes through an intermediary, that they basically have to forward it, can't modify it, is it also possible for two endpoints to just pre-agree that flow, a flow ID has a certain meaning without sending a dynamic registration of that on the wire? So you wouldn't be able to do on-the-fly compression that way? That, yeah, that's true, but I mean, there's, and I think we have, there's a couple of different examples we've given for how flow IDs can be used. One of them is compression, which, you know, obviously has to be dynamic, but another use for it that you've given in the timestamp example is really just about datagram type. And that is something which could be statically negotiated and just say, when a, I, I am intending to use flow IDs to differentiate different types of datagrams on the same stream. And when I send type zero, it's, got a timestamp and when I send type one, it doesn't or, or whatever. And then I don't need yes. that message to no, be so, dynamic. So, so you're totally right that not everyone you, needs the dynamic property, but if you have the dynamic property, you can implement static with dynamic, but not vice versa. I guess the reason I'm asking, I mean, since the intermediaries have to ignore them anyway, maybe there's no way to stop me from doing this, but it, it also gets around some of the problems we're talking about with uh, what happens if this message doesn't make it through and can I start sending things with a given identifier, if it's sort of unilaterally defined by my extension that I'm going to have the flow IDs have this particular semantic, then I don't have to worry about running into those issues. So you, I think you need these issues no matter what, if you want false start, as in even, you know, if you want to be able to send datagrams before you've received the HTTP response to your connect UDP request, you're gonna to have to handle this problem no matter what. I think this problem is orthogonal from the dynamic versus static. Cause even if you do static at the beginning during the request response, you still have this problem. So we need to solve it no matter what. Well, I think you end up with two layers of the problem. Like one of them is like, are you, did you get the datagram no. before you even got the headers? And another one is uh, halfway through the stream, I'm now decide I wanna start sending you something I haven't sent you before. And now I have to worry about it all over again that you're yeah. going, that maybe you haven't well, received it, my register message. But it's not all over again. You solve the problem once and for all, right? If you need to solve it for one, you solve it for both and you're done. Uh, and the solution is very simple here. You just, if you see a context ID that you don't know, you either drop it on the floor or you buffer it with, you know, being very careful to not allow infinite buffering. You know, that's how you do false, like things like false start, right? That's simple, it works, and it's not really much of a concern. Uh, okay, I guess we'll go back to my original question, which is, are these mess is register flow ID message required or is it optional if I, if endpoints already know? So that is a, uh, 
uh, that's actually a separate slide where uh, I think there are use cases where folks don't need this. And so it's talking about how we make it optional is, is an upcoming slide. So let's, let's put a pin in that for now. Okay. Uh, then uh, Tommy says plus one to the message design, then Mike. Um, so I'll just point out in terms of history here, the priority update that HTTP is working on decided to use both headers and frames for something like this. Using a header so that you get the information with the request and you don't have to worry so much about timing, but then using a frame to update it later. Um, it's also worth noting that this is intended to be end to end, but if you use a frame for this, that is hop by hop from an HTTP standpoint. So you'd have to mandate that intermediaries forward it. Correct. Cool. Thank you. So this one I wouldn't say is as clear cut as our first one, but I'm kind of getting a sense uh, that some folk, more folks are leaning towards message, but we, we definitely need to confirm it on the list because that. It's not absolutely clear. Uh, next slide, please. Which, all right, let's see, we have a minute left. I'll just bring that one and we'll skip the rest of the slides. It was on the topic of uh, things being optional. Um, so there are cases, take like web transport, for example, that in my understanding don't need, you know, uh, the second layer of context ID or flow ID and um, don't want to, you know, spend that extra bite on the wire of uh, when they don't need it. And one proposal from Lucas on the list uh, this morning was to, if we go with the register message, you can add a separate message, which instead of registering one flow ID just says, okay, for this entire stream, there will not be any flow IDs, like boom, the whole thing is set. Um, that actually works nicely and it works well with false start as well. So I think that gives us kind of the best of both worlds where methods um, and or other kinds of extensions that don't need this don't have to use it, but it's built in such a way that allows us the extensibility. So I'm pretty happy with this and it doesn't add too much complexity. Do folks have thoughts? And keep them quick because we're pretty much 30 seconds. Oh, you know what? We're, we're out of time and the chairs are gonna be grumpy at me. I think we're gonna have to take this to the list. Um, um, point, of, point of order. Go ahead, Chris. Before we, yeah, so we're just about at time for this. It seems like we're making really good progress and this is blocking some of our other progress on the rest of Connect UDP. So we do have the option to drop the rest of our as time permits things if folks feel that this is valuable and we can add that time back into here. That's the meaning of as time permits. Also, I mean, this is the number one highest priority working group item, so and by charter. That makes agree. sense to me. I'll, I'll leave it up to the chairs. Excellent. All right. 20 more minutes. Okay. Let's go. All right. Let's go. Um, then uh, Ben Schwartz was first in the queue. Hey, uh, I I don't think this topic is actually that high priority. Um, like I connect UDP as a whole, sure. Like this specific message, not so much. But since we're talking about it, uh, I I don't think this is necessary. Um, if you're in a web, if you're in a web transport, you know you don't. Uh, and apparently, if the, if the design doesn't call for flow IDs, then you know you don't need flow IDs, and we don't need a frame to talk about it. You, at both sides, already know. If you're in Connect UDP, we've decided we want flow IDs. I don't think we need the ability to drop them for the sake of trying to save one byte. Uh, so I think that it's implicit. But if you believe that it's not implicit, then I still think a message is the wrong way to do this because it greatly complicates the false start reordering behavior. Uh, it means uh, in in what way does it complicate it? If you get a datagram on a request before you've received a registration message, you don't know whether you're in single flow or multi flow. Okay. So you can't even look at the flow ID yet. So this means that instead nope, of having but, but two... hold on, hold on. The important property of false start, and the only way I can see to implement it is if you get a message and you like you get a datagram frame, sorry, and you haven't received any register message, you can't parse it no matter what. There's no point in parsing the flow right. ID because if even if you had access to the flow ID, you wouldn't know what to do with it. So as until you've received a single register, any register message, you're gonna have to buffer or drop these. 
And the moment you've received one, boom, you know in which mode you're on. Yeah, so it doesn't buffering. make this more complex. It adds states to your state machine. It means that instead of I get a packet that came in, I look at the I look at the context ID to find out what to do with it. I see if I have a matching context ID. And then if I do, I go, otherwise I buffer. Instead, I have to have an additional check and an additional asynchronous state where before I even attempt to look at the flow ID, I first have to wait until I've figured out whether I'm in the flow ID state. I have another set of interacting asynchronous events that, to, to juggle. Um, it's, I, I would, for that reason, I'd say if we need to, um, if we really need this, then it should go in an HTTP header so that it's uh, finalized before we start receiving data. That is also an option. Uh, thank you. Uh, John? Uh, thanks, David. I, I I was going to say, I think I'm not going to try and parse and respond to what Ben said, because I still need to think about that. But I think that you need something. I think you, you pointed out that you need some sort of a registration mechanism. Otherwise, the implicit one makes the timing difficult. I don't know how to establish synchronization if you don't have if you have an implicit one. So you need something, maybe it's a header, maybe it's this, but you need something to say that I'm going to, uh, I'm not going to have flow IDs uh, in, in subsequent messages. So yeah, uh, I think plus one to this, I, I, I don't want to speak to headers because I, 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 I think the whole point of this was to keep this end to end. Um, it seems like having this message would be the simplest thing to do. Cool, thanks, Jana. Uh, all right, sorry, let me look at the queue. There was a bunch of plus ones which aren't plus queues. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Uh, Eckers in the queue. Yeah, so I'm not sure what I think about this particular thing, but I'm getting the impression we don't actually have as good a handle on false start, which your people are begging you to rename um, um, as we might want. Um, um, so I think perhaps I'm worth fleshing out in some detail what like we really this means. Um, as I pointed out in, in the okay. chat, there are there are really two semantics, right? One is um, I've sent a setup packet, and if that setup packet fails, then like these packets will be irrelevant. Um, and that's like if I say connect to this like remote location, right? Um, if like I you know if I send you a connect request to an invalid IP address, like nothing's going to salvage that, and whatever packets I send associate that flow just going to be thrown away. And the other is a soft state. And I'm saying like set up this compression context, and then if that if that packet gets lost, then actually let's do something somewhat different. And because those packets will eventually be admitted by, by either either by the end or by the by the intermediate point. And so those are conceptually um, so somewhat different. Um, and we and it, it might have different. It might in fact have different requirements in terms of buffering and in terms of um, uh, in, in, ter, in, ter, in ter, buffering versus transmission. So. Um, I, I guess I think conceptually it might be helpful to try to break out what people really expect and whether those people to buffer. Because um, apart from another valid implementation, especially in the one in the in the, in the version which is um, which is connected to the other side, um, would be um, would be merely to drop the packets, right, and and, and count on and count on the, the origin or retransmit, um, which would actually have some so, of the right rate control behaviors. Yeah. So. Uh... The way I think about it, and you know, tell me if this doesn't make sense, is I really think those reduce to the same problem. So let, let me try to say some more. Uh, conceptually, the idea here is you're doing some kind of negotiation step. And you know, this applies to far start in TLS, by the way, where you say, okay, I want to do this, you know, this being set up a TLS connection to you. Uh, and then you say, okay, let me just send data before I know whether you're okay with that or, or, or not. Um, and that, you know, it, if you're okay, boom, we've saved time, everyone's happy. If you're not okay, this data went into a black hole. It, it's dead, right? Like that's that's kind of the fundamental property. If that, and then, and you get some kind of notification that that, that happened. Um, conceptually, then you have a decision to make uh, about retrying. And the retry could be at any layer in the stack. Let's say, you know, if your browser is getting like the, the false start didn't work at TLS, you could imagine retrying your entire HTTP get from like all the way at the top. Or in this case, let's say if you're doing, you know, connect UDP and that didn't work, maybe you're gonna retry and retry like your quick request over, you're gonna say, oh, quick isn't working. I'm gonna try HTTP two instead. Uh, and so I really equate all these to the same thing, which is just a, 
I'm optimistically sending something knowing that you might decide to drop it on the floor. And as an optimization, I might trigger on that notification to retry immediately. But in practice, you know, we're talking about datagram frames here that can be lost anyway. And so if you know something gets black holes, the world doesn't end, we already have to handle that. So I think all of like your, your two separate cases really are the same one in my mind. Am I missing something? Well, I think if, only if you think layers, protocol layers doesn't matter, um, you know, um, which I do. Um, so, um, I mean, I think like which layer of things happen at matters. And so in one of these cases, the, 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 the issue is handleable at the mask layer and, and, and other, uh, other layers is not. Um, and in particular, if, you know, if I try, if I ask you to bind to an invalid IP address, um, you know, I ask you to, um, or when it's forbidden by policy, then that, th that has to report an error to the, to, to the, the consumer of mask and it has to, has to handle it. Whereas in the, um, whereas if what happens is the packets, if, if, what, if what happens is I ask for, um, you know, I say, please initiate a new compression context. And you're like, sorry, I don't have, I'm don't. i going to have 30 and you've already done 30. Um, and that has to be handled at the, at the mask layer at some level, right? Um, um, so I think I think I think, so I think I think that like I mean yes so sure I mean at some level yes like I make it bored and hit the reload button in my browser but I think but I mean like I think this I think the landing points do matter but I guess I'm just I think I'm just generally saying is you keep saying buffering on the receiver side but like um, is that but but I mean like as I say is is are, are is is a perfectly valid implementation to simply discard anything which you don't have how to parse and if that's true then it's really optimizing for buffering at all. Uh, so. First off, yes, uh, if you get something that you don't know the semantics of and you drop it on the floor instead of buffering it, that is perfectly legal. The buffering is optimization um, in case you get uh, reordering. So to take, for example, in quick, we do this for ZRTT. If you get ZRTT before the client hello, you can drop it on the floor or you can decide to buffer it in hopes of getting the, the uh, client hello there. Both work. One is faster than the other, but costs more memory. That's what we do in our implementation of Quick, for example, uh, and, and I'm kind of really envisioning the same property here. Sure, well, I think that that might be helpful to like uh, to do, to document more clearly. So I think I'm, I'm so as a concrete example of what Ben was saying, right? Um, you know, if I get a if if I don't know whether or not flow IDs are in that are valid or not, um, or are going to are going to apply, then when I get these packets, I don't know how to do with them, right? And um, and maybe, and, and, and maybe if I knew what the flow IDs were, I know how to sort them or bucket them or something like that. So I think it's like yeah, exactly what the receiver of the packet knows when it receives it is important information if you're going to buffer. Anyway, like I, I just I think it'd be useful to like actually map out a little more detail how we expect um, this this optimization to work for the structure. No, no, uh, absolutely, and, and just to be clear, the goal here was to talk about like ten thousand foot properties. When you know this will turn into a PR with a bunch of text that will hopefully answer these questions. Okay. But you're you're right. We'll have to write that nicely. Um, cool, thanks. Uh, then there's a bunch of discussion on having a better name for false start. Happy to call it something else. Uh, Martin Duke. He dropped out of the queue later. Oh, okay. Uh, Lucas. I, I just want to give an example, like having done something with Connect UDP in, in, in a client, you know, it's really easy to do a one shot Connect UDP and provide a, a, a quick initial packet and then kind of just switch contacts and move on to some other work. Um, and on, on the receiver side, yeah, okay, it's going to receive the Connect UDP and then, and then it's just going to respond with the 200. There's not a wait for a TCP and an ACK and all of that stuff. So like, it's nice. It's a nice property just to send some stuff. And yeah, if the packet gets dropped by by the mask server, it doesn't buffer it. Okay, I can wait for a retransmission timer to fire and do some stuff. Like I personally, I don't see the issue with whatever this thing we want to call it, fast open or whatever. Like yeah. it's a nice thing to keep, um, in my opinion. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. And I really agree. And actually, for the for the record, uh, in my implementation of Connect UDP, uh, the client doesn't wait for the HTTP 200 uh, before it starts sending datagrams and the server doesn't buffer them. If the server gets a datagram of a flight he doesn't know, drops it on the floor, everything works great. Um, because yeah, if you, 
conceptually, if that packet gets lost, it's the same from the client's perspective, it's the same thing as if that UDP packet had been lost between the proxy and the target. So you need to handle that case. If you want to be a bit more clever, you can, but this just works and it gives you like really, you know, much, you save a round trip, which is really important. Um, thanks, uh, Alex. Uh, thanks, David. I wanted to actually uh, address something that Ecker was saying, which I found a little bit confusing when we were talking about things like the compression context and saying that you can't uh, afford to lose that. I, I think that's uh, fundamentally a type error, right? If you're sending something like a compression context that you can't afford to lose on an unreliable datagram, then I think that extension is, is malformed. If you're sending data like that, that would be, I don't know, potentially sent I, along I, with this. I, I... I don't think that's what Ecker meant. And I'm just going to maybe rephrase it differently. And Ecker, you can correct me if I'm wrong. He's saying, what if you have a packet that you want to compress and you say, I want to do compression. You send that reliably. But then the other side says, no, I don't want to compress for you. I'm out of memory. Uh, and then you have conceptually, you could say, OK, now I want to retransmit this uncompressed. Uh, and this goes back to what we were talking about false start, which is, we yes, you could do this, but it's probably a lot simpler to just say, "Oh, well, that packet got lost." So is right, and and I think that basically just means that we have a, a fundamental requirement that any anyone who wants to send packets before confirmation needs to be able to tolerate those losses. And like in theory, yeah. you should be able to tolerate those losses anyway. You're using an unreliable transport. Cool. Thanks. Definitely agree. Um, all right, so that's the end of the queue for this slide. Um, we ended up not really talking about this slide. Um, clearly, we need more discussion on this one. Uh, we don't have enough to declare any kind of consensus, but uh, that way, I think we set the stage so that. Uh, so, by the way, yeah, I'm going to file an issue for each of these slides, and we can keep the conversation going on all of these to you know drive consensus eventually. Next slide, please. Um, so this. I have a, like we have a few things about what the message would uh, look like. Uh, it's you know assuming that we decide to go to the message and not the header, and I'm hoping like we should still go through these because going for the message sounds like a very possible outcome. And also, I think discussing this will help people understand what the message kind of looks like. Um, so the question is, okay, let's assume that we agree that we want this message. Uh, how do we send it on the wire? What does it look like? Um, the two proposals that I've seen so far are, so the one on the left is flow ID zero. You uh, reserve datagram flow ID zero as a control channel. And so th that has the neat property that, um, you know, datagrams are already, intermediaries know how to handle them and chuck them all the way end to end anyway. And so they don't have to do any more work for this. Um, the downside is it means that messages can be sent unreliably, which is kind of weird. And you definitely need a way to send those reliably. So it requires adding a reliable datagram frame that the intermediary needs to know about, which like it's at the HTTP3 layer and it has roughly the same semantics as the quick datagram frame. Uh, apart from it doesn't need the stream ID because it's already inside an HTTP3 stream. It just has the flow ID. Um, and then the alternate design here on the right is we create an H3 frame for this. Um, it, it's a cleaner separation. It doesn't have this notion of, wait, what do you mean you can send this unreliably? But it means that the intermediary needs to like know how to parse this frame. And by parse, I just mean like look at the HTTP3 type and go, oh, this is this, copy the, the data and send it to the right backend or vice versa to the right client. And that's it. Uh, no parsing of what's inside, no looking at the flow IDs, no looking at any of the extension information, just copy paste. Um, do folks have thoughts? Uh, so I see Ben, let me just double check that any there wasn't, yep, yep, Ben, go ahead. There are a lot of different ways to spell this. I think it's a bike shed. Uh, I, re I don't think it's uh, worth, worth meeting time right now. I'll just say, I don't really like either of these. And I think that there are some other combination that's the equivalent, but uh, cleaner. Uh, okay, uh, the the one on the left was uh, your proposal, Ben. Um, so uh, it's yeah, I think actually... we can do it. Yeah, it was. Uh, I think we can do even better. Okay, then I will say um, let 
please send us your uh, what what would be even better because I'd love to hear it. Um, and I have actually a few slides on this message design. So then let's maybe breeze through them a little bit so we see kind of all the possible questions. Uh, next slide, please. So there, and, and again, th this was part of Ben's proposal where uh, Ben proposed the one on the right, um, but pretty much we have two ways of doing this. We either say, okay, this frame is just register flow ID and that's it. Or we add in yet another layer of abstraction because layers of abstractions are great, where this frame slash flow ID zero, however we want to do it, means this is a control message. And then you have a, a variant that says, what message is this? Where you know zero would be register flow ID, and then but it allows extensibility there. My gut feeling there is that it reminds me of SNI, which had uh, you know, one of those extensibly joints that immediately rusted shut, meaning that SNI, you can say what type of it and you can only say host name. So it was kind of a waste. Um, and, but the, the one property it has that I think is kind of cool is that the extensibility, unlike something like SNI, the extensibility becomes end to end. Whereas if you say define a new H3 frame every time you do this, um, you would have to modify the intermediaries. Whereas this, if you have the intermediaries just copying things back and forth without looking at them at all, that allows you to have an extension that's end to end without modifying the intermediary. So that's kind of neat. Um, all right, uh, next slide, please. Uh, and uh, another part, and so this one, that is even more of a bike shed. So let's not completely dive into how we should do it, but just to keep it in the back of people's mind, you, in this frame, you need to have the flow ID to say, okay, I'm registering this flow ID, but you also need more information. So for example, like I'm registering flow ID 42 and I want to do IP compression with this IP and this port. Um, so right now it's a list of text key value pairs because that's just easy. Uh, in one of the proposals, we talked about doing QPAC and then people said, wait, you're inventing middlers. We don't want middlers. So I we said, absolutely not. Let's not do middlers. I agree. Um, we could also have a binary encoding that is you know, more akin to TLVs and how quick transfer parameters look. That's something, but that is definitely on the color of the bike shed spectrum. So we'll have to, we'll, but we'll have to figure that one out. Um, next, um, next slide, please. And then uh, another point, which was, do we need the reliable datagram frame? So there are some cases where we were saying it would be nice to be able to send datagrams reliably sometimes. Uh, like for Connect UDP, some folks were saying, well, I would like to send my first UDP packet reliably because if I lose the, um, um, the connect request, there's, it's, the server, the proxy is not going to be able to parse it until I retransmit that. So might as well same shove the first UDP packet in that and then retransmit it as well. Um, in in the design where we use flow ID zero as a control channel, we absolutely need this because that way we want to send those as reliable datagrams. But in other designs, it's more of a nice to have because you could also do it by de defining a TLV encoding on the data stream. Uh, the only downside here, well. The only property here that is goes both ways is it requires intermediary support, just like you know parsing the datagram frame. So if we put it in early, then we have it. It costs a bit more first, but if we don't do it now, it might make it much harder to do it later because updating intermediaries is hard. So again, another open question we have here. Uh, question from Jonna. A quick comment. Uh, I mean, this ties to everything I've been. I'm trying to think about how to do. You want to do the, if my understanding is correct, I think it'd be, it'd be helpful to actually characterize what the properties are that you want for the register messages and then figure out how to map them to quick primitives. This is how I'm thinking about this. Yeah. And when I do think about it that way, reliable datagram is a double negative, right? In the quick world anyways. <laughs> um, so that's kind of weird. Uh, and I think we have a name for that. It's called streams. We might want to consider something that you use. I, I, don't want to design it right now, but it just seems like reliable datagram is nothing but a stream. We might need to figure out how to do IDs and 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 and, and associate things with things, but uh, it seems like we might want to go back to looking at the parameters that Quick offers to to map to the requirements of these messages. 
So, so, so to clarify, John, this is this would be an HTTP three frame, and that's one of the things that we kind of messed up in quick. Quick frames and HTTP three frames are complete different things. So, at the quick layer, this would be sent over a stream. The idea would be, how do you encode a datagram inside a stream? And you say, this is a frame at the H three layer. And I apologize, I should have spelled that out in the slides. So that that's why that's how this would look. No, I get that, but I think again the same thing applies to HTTP three, right? The default assumption is that it is reliable. The whole point with Datagram, the whole point of writing this draft is so that you can actually afford to use HTTP three along with unreliable Datagrams. Agreed. And so, to me, reliable Datagram again, even in the HTTP three world itself, sounds like a data frame. Um, do you disagree with that? Okay. I mean. This is just a way to send the same, like the same semantics, but over a stream. It's uh, another way to say it is you could build this without a frame and say like, have your congestion controller retransmit that datagram frame, but it's simpler to just have one one layer above shove this here. But again, you could put it in the data stream and then you're done. That is totally a valid option. So I think what yeah, you're no, saying is you don't I like this frame. HTTP3. Well, I'm saying that this frame is the same as the data frame in HTTP3. Data frame, is it not? Well, no, because the 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 data stream in HTTP three is a stream, and it doesn't have delineation. So, you if you wanted to send these datagrams in the data stream, you would need to de define for every request a TLV scheme inside your data stream, because sure. intermediaries sure, sure, do sure. not respect the boundaries of data frames in HTTP three. Okay, fair enough. Cool, thanks, uh, Mike. So I just wanted to note another way of um, thinking of this in the H3 context. We defined all H3 frames to be hop by hop and only the request itself is end to end. This is effectively an end to end wrapper for an H3 frame. That is true. Is that bad? No, I'm just genuinely asking. No, I don't think it's bad. I, I think if we build something like this, let's not scope it so narrowly that it's only for datagram. This is an envelope that says, I would like you to forward this to the end. Keep it with my stream. Okay, that's, that, that is an interesting thought. I don't want to do two things that are too generic, but yeah, that could, that could be neat. All right, thank you. Okay, and this brings me, uh, next slide please to the end of our slides um, on H3Dgram. So I'm really happy we landed, uh, well, we'll confirm on the list, but we landed on in a good spot for the one, two, uh, so the two layer, or what I call the two layer design. A lot of the other questions um, we will need to talk about more and that's cool. I'll take an action item to file a GitHub issue for every single one of these. And then I'll email the list and please double check. And if I've forgotten anything, please follow more issues. I think it would be great for us to like discuss these more and uh, uh, chairs maybe at some point, um, maybe uh, I would love probably prefer another interim next month uh, for us to make more progress here, depending on how we make progress on GitHub and on the list. Um, but then otherwise back to you chairs. Thanks David. All right, sounds like we've got enough to make some good forwards progress there. Uh, please do update us when we've gotten a little bit of that done. And of course, we'll keep the discussion going on GitHub and on the list. Next up, we have a shortened quick aware proxying here. And that is Tommy. All right, I'll go shorter than 10 minutes. And the purpose Even of better. this is just to to give a little bit of explanation of the stuff we're currently doing, not to have an in-depth discussion, but since this is one way of doing an extension, it can inform some of the other discussion. Next slide, please. Um, so this is primarily looking at ways in which we can modify uh, the base connect UDP to make it work a little bit better for doing quick within quick. Um, I think there are some parts of this where we have text about advice for handling quick migration, handling um, other uh, 
cases of how do you deal with the sizes that you want, the initial sizes for packets for quick within quick, that actually could apply to connected UDP in general. And so maybe those could move over, but specifically the extension mechanism in here is about letting the proxy be aware of the connection IDs. And that allows a couple different things. One, it does allow you to reuse um, ports between a proxy and a target so that if it is having to use V4 or just has a ton of connections going through, it doesn't need to actually open up necessarily a new uh, UDP socket for every single quick connection that's being proxied since the connection IDs can do the job of demultiplexing. Um, that also has some effect of uh, obscuring how many clients you have exactly. And then the other big aspect is improving the efficiency and performance. Um, so this has, there are kind of two problems here. One is if you're doing a lot of quick within quick, um, there can be just processing overhead. That's not necessarily as um, Ecker was pointing out on the list, not necessarily the crypto being the concern, but just some of the, the fact that you have to process it in software, um, oftentimes in a deployment. But then also there's a the concern about you are losing some MTU during encapsulation of quick within a quick datagram, potentially within another quick datagram. And that is something that should be solved, that can be solved by compression, but that can also be solved by not having to re-encapsulate. Next slide. Next slide, please. Sorry. Um, yeah, so as far as applicability, a lot of what I'm thinking about here is when you have multiple proxy hops um, being used to kind of further obfuscate um, what IP address is being used and not allow one proxy to unilaterally kind of know everything about a flow. Um, and so if you have a bunch of proxy hops, you can potentially have cases where you don't need to fully re-encapsulate or re-encrypt on every hop. Um, this mechanism of doing forwarding in which you kind of do a secure handshake, but then you just forward quick packets end to end is not absolutely not for everyone and not for all cases. It does allow you to, if you have an observer across multiple parts of a path to be able to correlate packets. Um, so that's not always applicable, not always useful, but in cases where that is not, um, kind of the main concern or attack, then this is useful. Um, it is critical for this, that both parties must consent before any type of forwarding mode is done. Next slide. Um, so I think the key thing for us is, you know, if we are doing multiple hops of connect UDP, the performance um, definitely is impacted if you are able to have quick awareness and start doing forwarding mode. So in tests of using a, a quiche based H3 proxy, um, we tested both with kind of normal connect UDP as Sorry, well. Tommy. Yes. Which quiche? Sorry, the um the one that Lucas works on, <laughs> the the Cloudflare based quiche, not not Sorry, Google. Thanks. Um, and um, you use so using the quick awareness to program forwarding rules um based on quick connection IDs, um into the NIC um, using eBPF rules um, and so this was just running a test, for example, on a one gig Ethernet link to uh, H3 next top. So next slide. I mean, it's, yeah. So um, on this link, you know, directly with H3, we could get 900 megabits per second, going through connect UDP, not super optimized, admittedly. You know, there's definitely overhead, um, but just very clearly being able to forward um, completely unsurprisingly, because it's just putting rules into hardware, um gets you very very fast and essentially line rate um so in cases where this is appropriate it makes it essentially free to go through one more hop and um you know it's not for treating this as like a pure vpn tunnel but essentially if you want to be able to have a quick router that you can have a handshake with and say i want to route through this hop and then that hop and then that hop it gives you a very very efficient way to do that Next slide. Um, so as we've been working on this, there are a couple of interesting issues that have come up. Some of these we've already 
uh, fix, these are slides from ITF 110, and we did come out with a rev of the doc just this week that tries to start talking about some of these. Um, and I do think that some of these issues are things that we could bring back into the overall conversation and thought around connect UDP, particularly when you are doing quick. Um, specifically, you have um, cases where you have to worry about the MTU um, and even kind of regardless of changes in MTU, we need to think about when we are doing connect UDP, what is our initial packet size that we're allowing? Um, because, you know, clearly you wouldn't want the connection between the client and the proxy to be constrained to 1200 bytes, because then you wouldn't even be able to put a quick initial packet through that tunnel. Um, but even if you, as you do um, for some implementations, like what Google does of hard coding it to 1350, you probably don't want to just try to stick 1350 inside a 1350 quick tunnel because that's not going to fit. Um, so we need to have some thoughts around path MTU discovery, et cetera. Um, doing connection migration is also um, quite interesting when you have a proxy here. Uh, there needs to be thought about um, if you are resetting your congestion control timer, uh, how does that get propagated up to the um, the target that you're connecting to. And then one other thing that we've already done is that um, it's important that if you are able to share um, sockets between the proxy and the target that you can do it um, potentially between quick flows where you can actually distinguish between them using connection IDs, but it's not necessarily safe to do that for other flows. Anyway, I think that's the end of these slides. So yeah. We don't need to spend a lot of time with questions or anything, but this is just one of the kind of motivating uh, areas that we can work on as extensions to connect UDP. Good or, question from Ecker. Yeah, I guess I'm really quite surprised by performance numbers here. Um, so, mm -hmm. um, you know, like we have plenty of examples of people doing line rate TLS at substantially higher than GE. Um, so like, I mean, this Netflix paper from a few years ago um, showing about how, how they did it. So like, mm -hmm. I don't know quite what the situation is here, but like the, you know, like to the extent to which, the extent to which like the, the particular implementation you had can't like handle like a gigabit of load, a quick load. Like I suspect that is an implementation problem and it can be temporary, it's, it's temporary as opposed to being a like inherent, like, like, I, like designing like, an, like, like basically sure. like doing, doing null ciphers so that like, because we, because we like, because like we're too lazy to, to like optimize like our kernel, TLS, our kernel quick implementation does not seem like the right trade off. <laughs> Sure. So, I mean, to be clear, I think even, you know, these are numbers from March. I think Keisha's own implementation for some of the stuff has improved since then. Um, however, I, I think there is something about, you know, scalability here, like being able to do a hardware offload of rules to essentially turn this into a, a, a quick handshake to a router that essentially then just becomes a router. So it's like a, a secure authenticated router. Um, is like that box is going to be able to have a lot more capacity if it's just programming rules, even if it is able to achieve good line rate, um, it's going to be able to handle more connections if it's just doing hardware offload rules. So again, like I, I do not think it should be used always. All the cases that we're looking at using it for would be uh, with a mix of forwarding and tunneling um, so that kind of no end-to-end -end user connection would ever be just forwarded, um, but kind of interior links where you don't necessarily have user data exposed, you already do have, um, you know, quick protection. So it's not, I don't think it's quite the same as saying we're using a null cipher on TLS. It's saying that we just don't need to wrap up the TLS encryption three or four times. I think we can, we can, we can argue this analogy later. Um, I think the yeah. second point I wanted to make is that, um, you know, all the multi-hop scenarios I'm familiar with are situations like Tor, where you mm -hmm. actually have, where you actually have really aggressive threat models. And in those aggressive threat models, you have to use different, um, different, different encryption anyway that does, that, just does, that has constant size frames and doesn't expand them. And so, like, like there's like a whole like Sphinx and a whole set of whole set of work on this. And so, like yeah. again, like I just like like the MTU thing. Like I like I, I guess, I mean, like 
I think it would be helpful for me in this document would be like a substantially more detail on exactly the applications which, which creates sure. the requirements. Sure. Because like, I'm just saying that these are a set of requirements which one often sees listed for having weaker security um, in exactly the sort of vague mode. And so it'd be helpful for me to have like a much clearer set of like exactly the applications that would allow me to assess where like these were good trade-offs to make. Yeah, that, that sounds good. And we can talk about that more in the future, um, certainly. Um, yeah, I, it, it is not the same as Tor. Absolutely. All right, we are at time. The couple of other folks who are in the queue, please take your questions or comments to the list. And next up, we have the end of some of our requirements, which is back to David. I'm back. Um, all right, it's me again. Uh, so now we're talking about the IP proxying requirements document. Um, and the, so the, we're, we're getting close to the end. I'm going to walk us through like a few of the remaining issues and then hand it off to the chairs on what the working group wants to go next. So first one, this one, I think would be easy. Uh, the current requirements draft said we sh should support HTTP2. Uh, it sounds like this feature is really important. So people were saying, no, no, like we need, need to support this. So there's a PR that's a one word change, which is we must support H2. Does anyone object to that? All right, I think we can declare this good. We'll confirm it on the list. Next slide, please. Uh, so the, the this is a clarification one, which was slightly editorial. So on the um, uh, support um, supporting route negotiation, it wasn't clear to everyone that this you know negotiating routes allows you to exchange a default route. So we have a PR that adds a sentence to make that crystal clear. Uh, does anyone object to this? I think I'm on the queue. So I'm um, happy to have a clarification here, but my comment, I believe, was also about if this is an optional thing or if it is a mandatory thing. Uh, about being able to negotiate routes? Yes. Oh, yeah. So right now it is uh, it is a mandatory bit. Yeah, and that was my question. Like, if that's not clear to me, because it addresses one specific use case, so it could also be an extension, um, as we've done with other extensions. I mean, that seems pretty, like you can't have any kind of tunneling without routes, uh, because then you don't know what you can send over it. So I don't see that as if the uh, proxy being... rewrites the IP address, and you know, is is the one that is responsible for having the IP address that is sent out. That you can have it. So, uh, I. I think let's maybe table this. So there's an issue further down about proxying IP packets or IP payloads. And depending on the resolution of that one, I think this one will be easier to resolve. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay. Uh, Alex? Uh, thanks, David. I, I just wanted to say that I think that this is a mandatory feature because of the other text in the IP proxy requirement, which says that we have multiple use cases some of which require routes. So sort of orthogonal to the payloads versus uh, packets question. Other use cases require this, so I don't see how we can avoid having it be not mandatory. So, I mean, I don't think that's a, that's a good discussion to have, so we should stop here. But we said for other use cases, if it's only one use case, it is an extension, not mandatory. And now we say because it's one use case, it's it's mandatory and should not be an extension. So I think this, I don't let's, think this needs anywhere. So let's just move let, on. Yeah, let's put a pin in this. I agreed. Um, all right, next slide, please. Um, so about validating the address assignment. So the um, right now the draft has a requirement for being able to assign an address to the peer. And uh, so this issue is about validating that the peer has authority over this address range. Um, this is a policy decision and policy is out of scope. So my pro so the proposed resolution here is to close with no action. Are there any objections? So I think, sorry, I should end up the queue. Uh, Go ahead, it is your issue, Maria. Yeah. <laughs> so I think this is more than a policy policy issue because if you if you need that, you also need um, protocol support for it, right? But what I'm, what 
like there's no there's a non requirement for address assignment. I think that's like just um, too much. So I would just remove this from the draft. Just to sorry, make... remove what from the draft? Yeah, the non requirement about address address assignment. I don't know why we have it and why we need it. So well, because you know, as with any document that defines scope, you need to define what's not in scope. Yeah, and it, I think it depends on the use case if you need this, and it depends on how we design the protocol if you need like protocol support for it. So I don't think why we need to re rule out this from the beginning. Well, because we've kind of, and that was part of our charting effort of like th these kinds of policies are not something that we want to do. You know, for example, saying that I'm authoritative over RFC 1918 space, I don't even know what that means. So I, again, like this, doesn't, I, I just really don't understand what we would build as part of the protocol here. Ecker's in the queue if we want to keep moving. Ecker, go ahead. Sure. I'm, I guess I'm trying to work out what's at stake here. Um, so, um, so as I, I mean, like just like ignoring the text for a second, as I understand the situation, there are effectively two operating modes for protocol like this. One is um, I, the client, just transmit my own addresses, and then the server nets to whatever like the heck it wants to it wants to net to, right? And the other is um, the server tells me what addresses it wants me to it wants me to send it to, and then maybe it nets or it doesn't, but presumably it doesn't, right? Um, though one might imagine it did. Maybe it, maybe you know maybe it sends me 19 agent, it, it maybe it gives me 19 18 addresses, and I nat to those, right? And then that's on the on the egress, right? Um, so um, if I um, as I understand it, this protocol is compatible. The, the, these requirements are compatible with, with, I, with the protocol implementing, I would say, so, um, either the second only or the second and the first, but not the first only, correct? Um, namely, that um, that this that it seems to me the requ implied requirement here is it must be the case that this protocol does support a way for the uh, server to give me an IP address range, which will then transfer un, un, unaffected out the, out the door, right? Um, um, but it could also be the case, uh, but it does not have a requirement that it not also provide the other function. Is that, is that what's at stake here? I Yes, I think the idea is that what transformations happen outside of mask are considered out of, uh, out of scope. Let's say, for example, if you want to put a NAT between what's happening in the mask tunnel and what's happening on the internet, we just clear that out of scope for mask. I think that's probably it. Well, um, well I, guess, I, guess what I'm, I guess what I'm trying to get at though is like, is, um, is do the, um, does this, is this text implying to say that the first thing you have to do is always to get an address assignment from the peer? Or? No, no, not at all. Uh, okay. And if you're asking what the text does, might I suggest reading the draft? I, I'm reading that. David, I, I, I am reading the text. So perhaps, you know, typically, typically the response to your text isn't clear is it's clear is not really quite the right answer. Um, okay, then if it's not clear, then absolutely let's fix that. Sorry about that. I'm trying to understand what's at, as I said, I'm trying to understand what's at stake in this discussion. So like, um, like, 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 what is it like, what is the question here about like this, this issue? I think that's a question for Miria because it's Miria's issue. Yes, yeah, so I should probably look back at the issue. Um, but like my memory is that this was about a non-requirement yeah. that is specifying out that like any yeah. kind of address validation In should not be supported, yeah. which I think we might so, want to support if like the netting is not a separate thing, but something that we integrate because we actually requested from the proxy for example. So I just don't want so, to rule yeah, out um, that we cannot right. do it if we want to do it, right? Yeah. Okay, no, no, so just to be clear, something being out of scope doesn't mean you can't do it, eh, like uh, as an extension or something. It just means that we don't need to go there. But might I suggest we move on to the last issue, because I think that's the most important one that really needs face-to-face uh, -face time. And this one isn't clearly for well-formed enough to, to have a conversation, because we're all confused. So maybe, Mary, if you could like add more text on the issue to help clarify this. Um, Tommy, could you make it? Uh, Real quick. I was just going to say, it sounds like the right thing to do here is specify that the base document for connect IP or whatever it's called should not do address validation, but do not say anything about extensions. And that I think will satisfy. I, uh, that sounds great to me. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Uh, next slide, please. 
All right, so this was the topic we breached a little bit at the previous ITF and it's the most important one when it comes to IP proxying in the mask working group. Uh, are we proxying IP packets or are we proxying IP payloads? Um, one point is if you build a solution that proxies IP packets, you're able to build an extension that compresses the packets, which therefore allows you to proxy IP payloads. But unfortunately, you can't go the other way around. If you have something that proxies IP payloads, you can't easily do IP packets. Uh, and I think this is the part where I handed over to the chairs to moderate this discussion. Yeah, thanks, David. Um, next slide. So just to remind everyone um, sort of what what we're trying to accomplish with the requirements doc and the purpose of this particular issue that David just mentioned. Um, we're trying to scope out the requirements for the solution that is connect IP that we'll eventually work on later on, hopefully shortly after um, you know, this meeting concludes and I, at the next ITF meeting. Um, the, the document itself is, is purely meant to, to support the particular solution. It's not meant to be published as an RFC or anything, so we don't need to get it perfect. Um, by any stretch of the means, uh, and uh, given all the work that's went into it so far, uh, and all the discussion that's generated, uh, Eric and I think that the document has basically done its job in terms of like helping us scope out what should be in this eventual solution and what should not be. Um, module one particular issue, and that's this this fundamental issue that David just raised. Um, so next slide, please, um, and that is whether or not. The, the base protocol should support uh, proxy and payloads uh, or packets. Um, we had a show of hands uh, during the last meeting um, in which the outcome cl uh, clearly uh, suggested that the uh, support for proxy and packets was uh, sort of essential, um, but less clear on whether or not proxy and payloads should be part of the base protocol. And so this is something that's sort of orthogonal to the actual solution. We'll have to sort out this question regardless of where we go with Connect IP. Um, so right now, with the ongoing consensus call on the list, we're just trying to answer this specific question. Um, next slide, please. And so our request to the people who have an opinion on this is to please chime in on the, the consensus call that's going on right now, um, uh, either by sharing use cases that would help justify one particular approach or the other, um, or just stating an opinion, either is fine. Um, ideally, we come out of this with consensus in terms of what the base protocol should do. Um, at that point, uh, we'll consider the requirements document uh, complete, uh, especially given the non-controversial issues that, uh, or the, yeah, the, the simple issues that David just went through um, regarding uh, H2 fallback and whatnot. Um, so I'd like to, to briefly pause um, and just ask if anyone sort of violently objects to that. Uh, um, and if not, I, I think that's that's what we'll do. <laughs> okay, great. So, again, please uh, take a look at the consensus call on, on the list, uh, chime in with an opinion, and then when that's done, uh, we can make the changes to the document accordingly, publish a new version, and then move on to the solutions uh, at the next ITF meeting. And uh, I guess, unless there's anything else, um, uh, we're right at the top of the hour so we can we can call it here uh thanks to mike for taking notes and for david for um speaking for so long um uh, we feel like this was pretty productive and we have a number of good uh avenues moving forward for the issue datagram work as well as the ip um uh, connect ip work so um yes and as eric points out please don't forget to uh add your name to the blue sheet and the notes um uh, with that i think we can call it Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you, folks.